Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, we're glad that you joined in with us today and we pray that uh, today's devotional will be a blessing to you. Before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just come to you, Lord. Pray that uh, this today's devotional, Lord, would be a blessing to each person that hears. Lord, wherever they are in their life, Lord, we pray that today that this word would speak to them in their innermost being, Lord. God, that will help them through whatever it is they're dealing with. And that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that they had to be touched by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we finished up our series the last time I met with you on 1 Corinthians 13. We called it Love in Action. And so today we're starting a new series uh, in Philippians chapter 3. And, t and I've entitled this one, Keeping Your Eyes on the Prize. Uh, the reason that is because this passage has 21 verses in it. And in verse 14, Paul says, I press on to the goal of the prize. I press on toward the goal of the prize. And so that's what we need to do is keep our eyes on the prize. The analogy he gives is running. And so we need to look at the end of the race and be able to see the prize that's ahead and keep our eyes on that because there's plenty of distractions uh, in the Christian life. Um, some people have uh, broken this down as uh, it begins in the first 11 chapters as the believers pass, and then from 12 to 16, the believers present, and then 17 through 21, the believers future. And it does break down that way, and you can look at it that way. We won't break down our outline in that fashion, but it, that is the progression, past, present, and future, that we keep our eyes on what is on the future, what lies ahead, which is a, a good way to do things. Think about people that say, you know, I want to be a doctor one day. Well, you don't just up and become a doctor one day. You say, well, that's what I'd like to see in the future. That's what I want in the future. That's my goal in the future. And that's my desire for the future. And so what the person does is they back up. They have to back up a long way and say, okay, this is going to start with college. And then they go through college and then they go through medical school and then they go through residency and then it goes on. And then finally they do reach the goal, but they'd have never reached the goal that even though they had their um, mindset on the prize, unless they backed up and said, this is what I got to do now so that that prize will finally show up and finally be something that they gain. And so that's what we should do in the Christian race and our Christian life as well, was we back up. That's the prize. What is the prize? Well, being with Christ and, um, you know, hearing those words from him, well done, that good and faithful servant, uh, getting the rewards that he gains, gives us, which I believe we give back to him and, and pleasing him. And, and him being pleased with what we did with our life, you know, those that's the goal. Because this life will end and eternity begins. And we need to finish this race well. And so we've got to back up and see those things. And I think that's how Paul does. I believe this chapter can also look, as we looked at past, present, future, we can look at some preparation that needs to happen so that that prize stays in focus and that prize will be obtained uh, by the believer. And so we, we look at this and, you know, we, we notice first of all, Paul must have been a, a great sports fan. He gives so many sports analogies uh, that help us uh, in learning and knowing what the Christian life is all about. I mean, he talks about boxing. He says, you know, therefore I run in such a way without aim. But then he says, I box in such a way that I'm not beating the air, you know, and that's a boxer analogy, you know. You shouldn't just be boxing air. You have a, a fight to fight out there. And so he uses that boxing analogy. He uses the wrestling analogy in Ephesians chapter 6. Before he talks about the uh, spiritual armor, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This word struggle, uh, when you look at it, it's the Greek word pale. It has to do with this kind of wrestling, a wrestling match. And he goes on to use that analogy. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, he said, I have fought the good fight. And so there's the fighting analogy. Uh, and then, of course, there's the race analogy uh, and the Olympics. 
in Acts 20, 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. In other words, he didn't have so much recognition of how things were going to be for him. So that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And he said, you know, I'm going to finish the course. I need to finish this race that was given me. And so we need to do that as well. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9.24, uh, Paul wrote, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? I mean, there's a lot of runners in a race. But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They, they then do it to receive a perishable wreath. In other words, something that will go away and fade. But we, an imperishable one, ours will never fade away, the prize that we receive. So he's saying, hey, run to win. There's only one winner. And again, we are not in competition with one another. Many believers look and say, well, look at them and look at them. Don't keep your eyes on the runner. You won't win a race. You never see a person in a race. You know, if you turn around and look behind you or look beside you, you're going to trip. You're going to be distracted. We're not in competition. We, just, we keep our eyes, what? On the prize. What's set before us. And so Paul gives these uh, great analogies in Scripture about racing and wrestling and boxing. And in this analogy that we're going to be looking at in the times that we do meet, uh, as we go through verse by verse in uh, Ephesians and Philippians chapter 3, we'll be knowing that that's the analogy, is the running of the race. And so I'd encourage you to get your Bibles out. We are going to look at it verse by verse. And uh, we're all, I believe, we're, when we see things, uh, it helps us to learn that visual and so uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, it would be very helpful to walk through this as we're looking at this passage that I believe will be helpful for us uh, in our race. Uh, we're going to be looking at three major points, I believe, of symbolism of what Paul says and how it's symbolic of what the Christian uh, race, the, so a runner and the Christian runner in the, in the race of the Christian life. Uh, the first one is runners must be legally registered in the race. And Christian runners, the person that's in the Christian race, they need to be saved. Uh, we can't legally be uh, in a race without registering. You have to register and qualify or whatever the mandates are. And then they give you maybe a, a number to put on your shirt uh, to show that you're legally in the race. You just can't run up there and start running. And you can't run this Christian race till you start with the right legal way, which is salvation through Christ. We can't just run up there on our own and say, okay, I'm good enough, or I read my Bible enough, or I go to the right church. Uh, no, that, those are some good things maybe that you want to do, you know, but you're not saved by your works. You're not saved by your church attendance. You're not saved by how much you pray, you're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so we have to start the race right. A lot of people bail out of the race sometimes because they've never legally got in the race. And especially toward the end, how would a runner feel that they, they're in the Olympics and they, they win first prize and they were disqualified because they never were legally registered to be in the race or to be in that particular race? What an embarrassment. What more of embarrassment to end the race of, the, of life and find out that you weren't legally in the race and to have to hear those words from the Lord, I never knew you. And so we've got to make sure that we're saved. And once we are saved, then we have what it takes from the Lord to run this race. And we won't be embarrassed at the end from not being legally in it. Uh, so we're going to look at five things under this point about salvation that that Christian runner that's saved uh, has to focus on. Number one is saved people enjoy a relationship with Christ. Saved people enjoy a relationship with Christ. You see how he starts it in verse 1, Finally, my brethren, and that doesn't mean he's finished. 
You know, Paul says finally, but he, he's not finished. He just even with this chapter, he's even starting. But what he means is, furthermore, I, I have more to say to you than what he said in the previous chapters. And what is that? It is rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, in our salvation. It's from the Lord, and we can rejoice in that, knowing that we're legally in this race. He paid the price so we could be in this race. And we can rejoice in that and praise the Lord. Why? Because we, we can enjoy that relationship with him that we didn't have before. Remember, it's not religion. It's relationship. Religion can be drudgery, toil. Uh, there's work in serving the Lord. Of course, we're not saved by works, but we, we labor for the Lord. But when it's a relationship, there's joy. Just like there's joy in serving people we love if we have the relationship with them. It's not drudgery. We enjoy being able to minister to them and serve them and love them because it's a relationship that we're in. And when it comes to Christ, we're in a relationship with him when we're, we're saved. And, um, you know, we deal with couples. You know, that's a, they feel like it's a drudgery. Well, it shouldn't be a drudgery. When you're in that relationship, you should make it a joy to serve them. And, and uh, same way with here. You know, if we relate back to... Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, we, we see where, or even before that passage, we see where the 70 disciples were sent out to do ministry. And when those 70 disciples come back in, in verse 17 of Luke chapter 10, uh, it's amazing to see what happens. It says the 70 return with joy. That's good. They, they are rejoicing, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Wow, they were just amazed. They were joyful because they did ministry, and when they did, demons even obeyed them in Jesus' name. And he, Jesus, said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He saw the victory. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Well, that's great news. Nevertheless, hmm, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You see, they were rejoicing in the demons being subject to them. And Jesus said, rejoice that you're saved, that your names are written in heaven. Why? Rejoice in the right thing. You know, maybe next week the demons may not be as, they may have, uh, they may have a failure. They may uh, fall. Uh, the prayer may not be answered at that moment. The circumstance may not seem like victory. You know, there's all kind of things, but when we rejoice in those things, if those things aren't present, we lose our rejoicing. We lose our joy. But when we rejoice that we're saved, when we rejoice, like Jesus said, that our names are written in heaven, nothing can take that away. We have that relationship with Christ forever. It's sealed. It's sealed, and we are guaranteed heaven. And that never can be taken away. Our salvation is secure. And so no matter what circumstances we're in, no matter what situation, we can say, hey, I'm saved. I can rejoice in that. I'm a runner. I fell. I tripped. All these things aren't going right in my race, but I'm legally in the race. <laughs> I am a Christian. I am saved, and that's enough to rejoice in. And so Jesus let them know right up front, rejoice in the right thing. You have a relationship with me, and that can never be taken away. And so that's number one. For the Christian runner that's legally in the race because they're saved, there's, they can enjoy, number one, their relationship with Christ. The second one is saved people should be discerning. Not only enjoy their relationship, they have to be discerning. And that's so important. If you see verse 1 picks up with, to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, 
who set their minds on earthly things. Look, we're going to have a lot of distractions in this Christian race. Distractions that make us look to the right or left. Distractions that keep our eyes off the prize. And we've got to be discerning so we can make right decisions. Boy, how many things have we messed up on life because we made wrong decisions? Or we were influenced the wrong way. There's plenty of people to lead us astray away from the gospel, away from the doctrines that we need to hold. Look how Paul lines out these passages. First of all, he gives great warning. He starts out with the word safeguard, and then he repeats the word beware three times. Beware, beware, beware of these things. It is stressing that we've got to beware that there's going to be false doctrine and false teachers, and there's going to be people that lead us astray. He, he, and look at the emotion that he puts in there, weeping. You know, this is the only time in the New Testament where Paul is weeping in the present tense. Meaning at that moment, Paul is weeping. Now he weeps other places, but in the present tense, weeping at the moment that he's saying this, shows the great emotion. And I believe the, the sincerity and, and the warning is so in his heart that he doesn't want people to be led astray, that this is such a a passionate emotion that he has to warn us. Look at the repetition. First he says, there's no trouble in me telling you again. <laughs> in other words, I don't mind repeating this another time. He even said, I've often told you, and I'll tell you again. Those words show the repetition. Uh, and of course, we've, we've said before, repetition is the key to learning. And the more we say it, the more emphasis we put. Paul does that as well. And then Paul gives the description of the people we've got to watch for. First of all, he calls them dogs, and he wasn't name-calling. Uh, this word here is a word that has not to do with pet dogs that we love and pet, and, and they sit in our lap, and, you know, they bring joy to us. And, but these, these are scavenger dogs. These are dogs that if, you, if you're around them, you're gonna, they, they can bite you. They can, they can hurt you. All these things that they can do to you. That's, that would be injurious to you. And so that, that's what we need to do. And they can give you, an, maybe if they have a disease as well, these were ravenous dogs. And then we see the people's heart, the evil. It says evil. Man, that's, that shows that their, their heart is not right. And then their false teaching, which was false circumcision. They were saying that, the, that it was necessary to be circumcised to be saved. We know that's not true. There's no work in salvation. It's all by grace through faith, not of ourselves. We don't do a work. And so they were giving people false information, which wasn't in the word, telling them they had to be circumcised. And then it talked about their opposition. It says they were enemies of the cross, enemies of the cross. Man, that's, that shows that what they were doing was not uh, in accordance with, with the will of God. And then their, their end, their end was destruction or waste. They were wasting their life because they were giving people false direction, false guidance, and, and that's not good for their own life or anybody else's that they're influencing. And then it says their God, which is Kolea. It says their God what it was. It was their appetite. It was their flesh. It was their sensual desires. They wanted what they wanted. How's this going to best affect me instead of what's God's will and what's God's truth? In other words, they made it all fit for their own desires. And then it says their glory is their shame. They were proud of what they should have been ashamed of. And what they, they thought this was great, that that's what they needed to be doing. And, and they wanted the freedom to exercise their flesh and their desires and and they should have been ashamed of that but they were proud and then it says their mindset their mindset uh, they would set their minds on earthly things on materialism on the world and that's not what we need to set our mind on is set our mind on Christ and Christ alone and so you can see these people exist today we'll be talking a little bit more about that than the other times that we meet but we can see that when we're racing there's going to be people and that distract us, that want to pull us away by saying, well, this is the truth, and it's not. We have to use the scripture as our guideline, and there's many out there when Paul's day and today that lead Christians astray, and many times they don't even, the Christian doesn't even know that they're being led astray, but we've got to be discerning so we can make those right decisions in our Christian walk. 
that'll be helpful. We're in the race to keep our eyes on the prize. We can enjoy our relationship with Christ. What a joy that is that we know Christ personally. Uh, that's, that's a joy and that our salvation is secure. But then we have to be discerning, beware, and watch that these things can happen that lead us astray easily, and then we end up not finishing the race well. Well, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you saved us and we can enjoy that relationship with you. Lord, give us the discernment, Lord, that we need, Lord, to make those right decisions. Father, to be able to see truth from error, to be able to see things that are distracting us from the prize that's set before us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessings on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that uh, this was a blessing to you and uh, just pray as you walk the walk and run the race that you'll keep your eyes on the prize. Just one announcement. I, I believe that for this uh, coming Sunday, uh, we're going to at the Magnolia campus, we're going to be having our 101 at 3 o'clock. Uh, I would encourage you that if you've never taken uh, 101, that you do it. Uh, if you've joined the church already and never taken 101, Hey, you need to be part of this class. Hey, if you've been visiting the church and you're considering maybe or like to know more about the church and what membership has to do here at Believers Fellowship, we would encourage you uh, to take this class as well because it's very informative. Uh, it'll, be at, uh, it'll be at 3 o'clock. I don't know if I said the right time. It'll be at 3 o'clock this Sunday, the 101. And so uh, if you haven't signed up, just call the church. And just let us know that you're coming. We'll make sure that we have all the preparations for you. It's not very long class, about an hour and a half, and um, we'll be. Uh, it'll be a blessing to you. The spring camps will be having their date set soon, and so they'll be getting that message to you out as well. So, hope to see you then. Uh, just want to let you know I love you, praying for you, and uh, believe God's uh, blessings upon you and your family and your life. Look forward to seeing you next time we meet. God bless you.